and welcome back to the Offspring Magazine, the podcast, season three. It's Bea, and I will be hosting today's podcast, the first episode of season three. Today, we will be talking to Professor Jens Brunning, who is the director of the Max Planck Institute for Metabolism Research in Cologne, as well as head of the Clinic for Endocrinology, Diabetes, and Preventative Medicine at the University Hospital in Cologne. In today's podcast, we will be specifically talking about diabetes, obesity, and metabolic dysfunction. I hope you will enjoy this podcast. Hi, Jens. Um, thank you so much for joining us sure. today on this podcast. I'm really excited to talk to you. Thank you so much. Um, so why don't you just start by introducing yourself and telling us what you do. Okay. I'm Jens Brinning. I'm director at the Max Planck Institute for Metabolism Research here in Cologne. Uh, at the same time, I'm heading the clinic uh, for endocrinology, diabetes, and preventive medicine at the University Hospital. And so doing both clinical practice in endocrinology, as well as, you know, directing the research program over here. Okay, so the, the works are really closely yeah. related. Yeah, and so the, the, the concept behind it is maybe originates from a history. So I'm a trained endocrinologist, so I went to medical school and then I started clinical training and uh, with a focus on diabetes. And I was really, you know, trying to understand what is you know, really the basis of the disease. And this is why I went to the States. I did a postdoc at Jocelyn Diabetes Center and started working on insulin action and insulin resistance. And then I, you know, after a couple of years, I came back to Cologne, finished my residency, and then got more and more interested in basic science and basically moved out of medicine and took on a professorship in the biology here at the University of Cologne. And then after some years, I was recruited to Max Planck. And at the same time, um, I, possibility came up that I could also go back to clinic and so I'm really now combining both sides which I really like and so conceptually the idea is that we run very basic studies at the MPI but we also have a translational angle so we have groups who are working on MRI imaging so we'll be talking about our science later right but uh, yeah. uh, who so that we do a lot of work in mouse models trying to understand the neurobiology of uh, metabolism regulation. And uh, so then we have groups of trying to you know, translate that to the human situation using, for example, fMRI imaging. And then it's, of course, great to really have the link to the clinic to also eventually bring in the patients suffering from the relevant diseases to also include them in the studies. And I think that's really the unique about this place that we can really go all the way from let's say a molecule in a neuron to a neurocircuitry in a mouse you know generate models that we eventually can test in the human situation yeah yeah it's actually a perfect setup here i mm. saw that it's really close and it's really on campus yeah. so it's really the university hospital is you know 100 meters away yeah. so it's really you know, i walk you know in between probably five, 10 times a day. So it's really, okay. really convenient to be on the same campus. Yeah, and you go there to uh, mainly like advise or treat Well, it's, it's basically, so I, I do one day outpatient service myself. So we really see patients that day and uh, and the rest is really interacting with the colleagues and also trying to bring them together with the, with the colleagues in the Institute and to nurture collaboration. And so this has been really, really, very fruitful and so we have residents who are in clinical training who then maybe spend the time for like two or three years in a in a more basic science mm -hmm. either in the lab or in the human translational group and then they go back to the clinic but they you know carry on and remain as a link between both entities basically. yeah cool yeah so we're at the Max Planck Institute of Metabolism Research translated in mm -hmm. English so why don't we start by talking about metabolism because a lot of people always use the term metabolism and a lot of people also claim like, oh, I have a fast metabolism or, oh, I have a slow metabolism. So let's just start by defining what is metabolism. Well, metabolism in, in, in any principle is just, you know, converting uh, things in the, in the body in, in the broadest sense. Uh, and of course, the, the specific metabolism that we are most interested in is, is actually glucose metabolism. And this is really where I come from. And this is how 
um, our understanding is what usually happens to glucose, so we consume carbohydrates, they get absorbed in the, in the body, and eventually they have to be you know, deposited in a cell, which needs the energy to be generated from it, whether it being, for example, classically a muscle cell or a fat cell, which is responsible for the uptake of, uh, of glucose and to further metabolize it. And so if you think about how to maintain a stable glucose concentration in blood, the only hormone that is really in action to do that is insulin. And this is released from the pancreas. And then insulin acts on you know, muscle and fat cells to promote mm -hmm. glucose uptake. And at the same time, it acts on the liver to suppress the new generation of glucose. So it does everything to lower blood glucose concentration. And that balance is very tightly regulated. And that, of course, doesn't work if you develop diabetes, and that's a disease we're interested in, and it affects currently about 10% of the population. And we know it's tightly coupled to uh, increased body weight, to obesity. So the more obese you get, the more likely you become insulin resistant, so the hormone doesn't work mm -hmm. anymore. And this is kind of the, the field we're operating in, asking why do you get obese? Why does you know, body weight regulation yeah. fail? and why subsequently then glucose metabolism gets out of control. So also just talking about glucose metabolism, is there something as I have a fast glucose metabolism and I have a slow glucose metabolism? Well, not that we're aware of it. I mean, so basically there's no such thing as an intrinsically slow yeah. or fast way. The, the, the question is how your body manages basically to fuel you know, glucose into the pathway to be metabolized. In other words, um, you know, how quickly does it get into a muscle cell and how is it then subsequently metabolized? But there's no like, intrinsic, mm. you know, difference in that. And so what actually controls then the glucose metabolism? Well, fundamentally it's insulin. insulin. And uh, in, on, you know, on the flip side of the coin, of course, you have a system in place that if you don't get fuel sources from outside of your body, let's say under starvation conditions, where no glucose comes in with the, with the food, then your body can convert you know, fatty acids and amino acids into glucose in the liver, which then maintain stable blood glucose concentrations, although at a lower level, because glucose is critical for your brain to function and to survive. And this is why you basically have this fine-tuned balance. And you know, on the other side, there are hormones like glucagon or corticosterone, which are active to maintain gluconeogenesis, the new production of glucose from the liver under conditions mm -hmm. of starvation. So it's always, um, you know, it's, it's very, and this is what I think is so fascinating, that you have sensors, which kind of sense any deviation to any direction, either going up or down, and that they then try to, to counterbalance that dysregulation and to really maintain what people consider homeostasis, you know, the yeah. stable regulation of a variable. And so when we're all born um, as newborns, I'm assuming that everyone has perfect regulation of insulin as well in the body. In principle, yeah. I mean, unless uh, super rare events, where, let's say if you're born with a you know, genetic mutation of an insulin set. I mean, yeah, but, but there's, there's like not so many rare. cases no, 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 of that, right? No, no, this is super rare. I mean, in principle, yeah. let's assume you're fine. Yes, yeah. Fine. And Luckily, so then when you when you lose this insulin regulation, mm -hmm. why is that the case? So I'm assuming <laughs> it's lifestyle factors, it's, if it's not genetic. It's not, it, it, first of all, it is genetic. So it is, we know that relatives of um, patients with diabetes have a higher risk to develop diabetes. So there is a genetic predisposition which is polygenic in nature. So it's not like you know monogenic disease. I mean, there are rare, as I said, super yeah. rare uh, cases, but let's say for the garden variety of subjects affected, it is really, uh, you know, different alleles coming together, each of them having only minor effects, but then if you accumulate a critical, let's say, number of variants in different, let's say, components of insulin signaling, for example, that then, you know, you, you reach a a certain threshold of impairment of insulin signaling and then mm -hmm. it, it turns against you but unfortunately it's it's really not even clear i mean although the, the genetic evidence is clear and we start seeing you know identifying more and more contributing variants it, it's just very difficult because you know it's a combination of so many alleles which has to come together then yeah 
And so that is one side. And then the other side, as you mentioned, is clearly our lifestyle, right? And so the, the, what we know is the more obese you get, the more you know, fat you accumulate, that massively drives the risk of diabetes and insulin resistance. And there's a lot of um, research has been going on, of course, trying to understand what is the link between being overweight and becoming insulin resistant in diabetes or pre-diabetes. This yeah. Like really flips over. And um, one, I think, very attractive hypothesis is is a concept which is called lipotoxicity. And so the the what what's behind that is that the the best way to store fat is in highly specialized fat cells. So fat cells okay. in our body, they're, they're perfectly primed to safely store lipid. It's basically, they have a huge lipid droplet, and then on demand, so basically you take out calories, it gets stored away in fat, and this is pretty much inert. It's not hurting, it's just sitting there and waiting to be used under conditions of starvation, for example. Then, you know, the fat is released, travels to the liver and so on. The problem probably begins if you exceed the storage capacity of that mm -hmm. highly specialized cell. So that's a friend of mine always terms it like that a fat cell in obesity is your friend and not your enemy. That's is if, if you would have an unlimited expandability of your fat tissue, very likely you wouldn't even get sick because you kind of put away your fat in a safe place and nothing really happens at worst yeah. to your body but for reasons which we haven't fully understood you know the expandability of fat cells in their lipid storage becomes limited and then you get kind of spillover of lipids into tissues such as liver and muscle and this is what we then call ectopic lipid deposition so let's say an unphysiological flow over of lipid into tissues which don't not have that specialized storing mm. capacity. And then in those tissues, the lipids can exert, you know, can inhibit insulin signaling, and then that links to the development of insulin resistance and ultimately diabetes. And so that's kind of at, at least an important contribution. Um, and of course, we're trying to understand exactly which specific lipid species out of the thousands of lipids is really the driver of insulin resistance and this is also where we have a research program that we're pretty active and, and really excited about. I really like that hypothesis actually. I've never, it's cool. it's like, I've never heard of it so uh, it was really interesting. Pretty, it makes sense as well. It actually, you know, it, it started being recognized from a rare disease. There, um, uh, there's a, a monogenic disease which is called lipodystrophy and those are patients um, who cannot form fat cells, right? Okay. Because of developmental yeah. defects. So they lack certain factors which allow them to make fat cells. And under that condition, you can easily imagine you consume fat, you cannot put it into adipose tissue because you don't have fat cells. And then, you know, the fat immediately goes to liver. Mm -hmm. And those patients basically, they, they have no fat, that they have massive enlargement of the liver, which is basically full of fat. They're massively insulin resistant. And so they're kind of the extreme model, which led to recognize, you know, that this partitioning of, of fat in, in across different organs is, is really critical to maintenance of normal. And then they you know, develop massive insulin resistance, completely uncontrolled uh, mm. diabetes. But then based on this hypothesis, it makes it seem like diabetes, this, this, this hypothesis would only fit really if you are diabetic because of your lifestyle. So maybe... But it's a combination it. of both, right? I mean, so yeah. let's say if you, if you assume it's a, it's a you know, polygenic disease, you start out with a certain risk to get it. And then you're, you're basically on a, on a curve that, that maybe your genes make you resist mm. even ectopic fat deposition. Um, that, that you're not very vulnerable to develop that insulin resistance, but, but there may be others who at the, you know, at the very low end already are predisposed to, you know, to, to flip over. And then, of course, the second component of that is, I mean, one is insulin action. Yeah. But the other one is that insulin has to be produced and released from the pancreas, from the pancreatic beta cells. So, uh, and so these are cells which produce insulin, 
and they have glucose sensors. So they kind of measure on a minute to minute basis how much glucose is there. And the moment the glucose rises, the insulin is released from those cells. And of course, at some point, or until a certain point, if you can have insulin resistant, but the beta cell kind of can compensate by you know, making more and more, putting out more and more into circulation to kind of overcome that resistance. But then eventually, if the beta cell had to work against mm. that mountain of resistance, eventually it collapses, fails, and then you, you get a reduction in insulin secretion, and then the whole thing uh, totally turns against you, and then your know, glucose control gets mm. out of control. Yeah. So, I mean, it's been already a lot of information. Yeah. So if we just break down also for the audience yeah. that isn't maybe um, doesn't know so much, what exactly is diabetes? Or if anything, also metabolic dysfunction. I guess we're only well, talking about diabetes here, but yeah. maybe we can also talk on a general term. But in, I think in, in, a, in a general term, is if, uh, it is ultimately if a homeostatically regulated variable gets out of control. Yeah. So if, you, if the body does not manage to maintain a certain variable, in that case glucose, within the pretty well-defined physiological range. And of course, all components that contribute to the physiological regulation, it being insulin you know, signaling in the periphery, insulin release, so all the you know, parameters which feed into that regulation um, can be you know, subject to alteration and, and basically flip you into a dysregulated metabolism in the broadest sense. Yeah. And so, it, yeah, so I guess you said, I mean, it can be genetic, it can be lifestyle, but we're really in an epidemic or in our pandemic of obesity. Right. Um, yeah, so, and um, I was also interested in kind of what controls this energy in, energy mm -hmm. out process, you know, because I guess that's also related yeah. to metabolic dysfunction. So what kind of are the main players that determine how much energy we yeah. keep in and how much energy we expend. So there's, a, again, as it, it's exactly the same principle. And I think this is what fascinates me about endocrinology or uh, is, is really the, you know, the feedback regulatory mechanisms which are put in place to maintain homeostasis. So you can, I've described to you, or we've discussed the you know, insulin feedback system yeah. to, to control glucose concentration. And there is a similar uh, system in place what you can view as a central regulator of, let's say, fat homeostasis. And that uh, hormonal system was only identified in the early 90s. And that has completely opened uh, our your way into understanding how body weight is regulated. So this was really a black box. I mean, compared to other regulatory systems, such as insulin, you know, which has been around for 100 mm -hmm. plus years, um, the, the, the question uh, was really, I mean, how is body weight regulated? And so there was a nice hypothesis put forth in the 50s by Kennedy. And he said, well, he proposed a homeostatic regulatory system for body weight. And uh, he basically proposed that there should be a sensor, in the broadest sense, which detects how much energy is in the body. So what that would predict is that there is a signal which is released in proportion to how much energy you have in your body. And he said, well, the, the brain is ultimately what decides am I going to mm -hmm. eat or not. So he predicted that there would be soluble factors coming from the periphery, you know, kind of as measures of energy state in the broadest sense. And he predicted that then there should be a receptor for that signal in the brain which then initiates a response to, you know, stop eating. So in, in a you know, homeostatic model, you would say you have enough fat, something X is released from fat, it acts on the brain and suppresses appetite. Mm -hmm. And if then, okay. if your energy stores drop, that factor drops, you disinhibit appetite, you start eating. And that was a nice model and it was around for 40 years and nobody knew really you know, what the molecular correlate for it was. And then a colleague at Rockefeller, uh, Jeff Friedman, identified exactly that factor. And uh, he basically uh, found a monogenetic, he defined the genetic defect of a monogenic mouse model, which was massively obese, weighing three times. So having un, 
stoppable eating desire. Let's put it like this. And so he found basically that this mouse model was lacking a hormone which it, which is released from adipose tissue. The more mm -hmm. the fat you store, the more of that factor you release. And he termed this leptin. For yeah. It's coming from Greece, uh, Greek uh, leptos lean. So he said that's a lean factor. So it's basically released from, if you have a lot of fat, you release a lot of leptin. And then subsequently they identified the leptin receptor, which was exactly in the brain centers which control eating. And if you now take that factor, let's say inject it into the brain of a mouse, then the mouse will stop eating because the receptor is in the brain. And so, and so that really pushed the door open for first you know, molecular correlate mm -hmm. system of body weight regulation. And then basically the research unfolded around that. So then uh, a colleague at Cambridge, Steve O'Reilly, he identified the first human who had monogenic um, obesity. And they were, I mean, not the first humans, which had monogenic obesity, but he identified the first patient who was basically the equivalent of that mouse who was lacking leptin. <clears throat> and it was entirely recapitulating the phenotype. So just telling us that this was really an evolutionary conserved pathway of body mm -hmm. weight regulation. So if you take a kid which lacks leptin, put them in front of a buffet, they will literally not stop eating. And so, and they get massively obese, they develop all complications very early on at, at young age. Uh, and that, of course, offers a charm for these kids <coughs> mm. that you can replace leptin, the hormone which is lacking, and you completely normalize their body weight. The problem is that, you know, the garden variety of obese patients, they have high leptin levels indicative of leptin resistance. So the hormone is there, but it just doesn't execute its normal regulatory functions, meaning yeah. you eat despite having a high signal coming from fat where there is enough fat, mm. stop eating, but somehow the brain doesn't, you know, listen to that signal. And this is like basically it's a complete analogy to, to diabetes that I was discussing. You have, you know, high glucose levels, you have high insulin, but then at some point muscle, liver and fat do not respond and return that insulin resistance. And similarly in obesity, you know, it seems to be the case that you develop leptin resistance. So the signal is there, it, you know, runs to the brain, but the brain doesn't, you know, initiate the appropriate response to reduce eating in proportion mm -hmm. to the energy store that you have. It seems like leptin and insulin are very much related. So yeah. do we, <clears throat> do we also see that when le le leptin goes up, insulin goes yeah. up as well? So it, they're very, completely very, related. So the basic, well, they're not completely related, but you can, you can, you, uh, there, there is, I mean, in, in a way, conceptually, you can view them as slightly different entities. So leptin is really released from the fat cell yeah. in response to how much fat is stored. So you can really look at it as a fat sensor. And insulin is released in proportion to a circulating blood glucose concentration. So it's more like the glucose sensor. So in principle, they're both sensing energy and therefore yeah. under many circumstances, they're regulated in parallel but they sense different, let's say, qualities of energy. And, and this is basically how we came into this. So we, we really then hypothesized, well, could insulin also act as a communicating signal to the brain? And then we generated mice which lack the insulin receptor, so the signaling molecule in the brain, and they also get mildly obese. So it's really not that insulin is such a strong regulator of body weight as is leptin. But what was really interesting and that is what my lab has been working on for the last 20 years is like, I mean, what, what I've been describing is kind of the textbook knowledge. So your insulin acts on the liver to suppress glucose production and on muscle and fat to remove glucose. Yeah. So you would predict in that picture, insulin signaling in the brain has no role, right? Yeah. And, so, and so when we then looked at mice which had no insulin receptor in the brain, despite the fact that they had the signaling machinery in the liver, in the muscle, and in the fat cell, they still were not able to maintain normal glucose concentration. So indicating that there was an additional yeah. signal coming from the brain, which also contributes to glucose regulation. And this is basically what my lab has been working on for the last 20 years, trying to understand where exactly in the brain, which neurons are involved, which other cells do they talk to, what kind of the neuronal network 
which controls mm -hmm. peripheral glucose metabolism. And so the, the way we are really viewing the system is that we, you know, many other colleagues and us have identified specific cell types in, in the brain which respond to leptin and to insulin. And so they have all the machinery to send so many different aspects of energy. So they can, you know, they integrate the signal of leptin, they integrate um, insulin. They also respond to another hormone, which is called ghrelin. This is released from the stomach when you're hungry. So it's more the driver of eating. It's, and they all, all those signals converge on the same neurons. And the concept that we're most interested in is basically, so you have those highly specialized neurons, which gets constantly instructed how much energy is in your body, you know, from all the different qualities of sensing. And then on one hand, they will control how much you eat, but on the other hand, they also regulate how energy sources within your body are partitioned and distributed. And so that's conceptually what we're interested in. So it's really yeah. like adapting whole body physiology. And so it's not only, am I going to eat? Am I not going to eat? Will glucose be taken up here or there? It, it, it's really what fascinates me personally the most is that I think we're looking at a system, a regulatory system, which kind of integrates all different aspects of physiology yeah, in I'm, accordance to the energy state of the body. I mean, body. it seems That's kind so of complex. Fun. It is totally complex. Like, it's, it's just, <laughs> it's so complex. Yeah. So this is why I also wanted to ask you, so there's this whole like calorie in, calorie out, like, mm. The calories that I take in, mm -hmm. that that's how much that's yeah. what's gonna determine weight loss and weight gain. But is At the that, end, yes. Is that true? But that would only apply to people that are metabolically healthy. Yeah. Because if you're metabolically unhealthy and yes. your signals are all out of balance, yeah. then that doesn't count anymore. Of course. And, and of course, as you say, there, there are two different uh, components of that. I mean one is calories in, calories out. But of course there is a still a different rate at which you know, different people metabolize the same amount of calories yeah. and that truly exists but at the end of the day uh, it you know it is really the, the the sheer simple balance between your personal actual energy expenditure on a given day at a given age which also declines over age importantly yeah. and the calories that you consume and I mean you can always make a very easy you know basically you can you can calculate the individual's energy expenditure and if you eat beyond that your weight goes in yeah. one direction if you drop it. and this is what i think is so fascinating about the system how accurate it actually has to balance this because you can make very simple calculations if if your that system is only off by a percent each day that that will give you an extra 20 kilos over a period of a few years. Right? Yeah. I mean, so it's, it's really that the, your, your system has to be so accurate in exactly determining you know, how much do I burn yeah. right now and really balance how much will I take up. And that's, of course, a problem. I mean, yeah. if that system doesn't work yeah, very yeah. well correctly. So going back to also leptin and insulin, mm -hmm. because when we define diabetes, it's usually insulin resistance. Right. But it seems like leptin plays a huge role in it as well. Absolutely, yes. I mean, it's. Uh, I mean, the, the, the again, it it always comes from. I mean, what what is a driver in an individual patient, right? So if you if what drives you towards your insulin resistance is really this massive weight gain, then probably the defect is more or the, the, the starting defect is more on the body weight regulation side. Mm -hmm. But then, as said, there are others who are more insulin resistant and don't have to gain so much weight, if at all, to get diabetes. So it's for each and every patient, you know, it, it may be different that it's more on the body weight regulation side or more on the insulin action signaling side yeah. where, where the individual problem lies. But, but it's, I mean, overall, if you look at the overall population, Clearly, the problem for us as a population is increasing numbers of obesity, and then diabetes basically runs in parallel with that. So we have now approximately thirty percent of you know, really mm. obese patients in the population, and you you can look at the map where you you know if you have epidemiological data, if you plot it, the increase in obesity and in diabetes over the last thirty years it runs totally in yeah. parallel. So is there also a link between um, 
it, so obesity, would it be more genetic or is that also more lifestyle factors? Because we've talked about diabetes, yeah. but obesity is still a different I thing. I mean, clearly, it's, a, it's, a, it's the same thing as diabetes at the end. The, there is clear genetic you know, determination of that, of body weight regulation. And we also you know, start understanding polygenic defects that contribute to obesity. But if you look at the dynamics of that you know, epidemic, as you termed it, right, it, I mean, our genes didn't change over the last 30 years. So it's really that, you know, we, I think if you look for it from an evolutionary perspective, um, I think our, our organism has been optimized, evolutionary speaking, you know, to make sure that what, I mean, basically our, our organism has been optimized under conditions of limited fuel sources, yeah. right? So if you want to evolutionarily develop your that organism according to the, that environment, you know the system is more tailored to making sure when energy shows up in front of your body that you readily absorb mm -hmm. it, store it away as fat. And in our daily life today, you know basically over a short period of time, has put that optimized organism in a completely different environment where suddenly food becomes available you know 24 7 and i think this is what we're witnessing it's really not uh, that our genes have changed mm. but that we that our lifestyle has changed so dramatically and that you know our body isn't really prepared for that yeah so the majority of obesity is still due well, to lifestyle yeah, changes true. Yeah, and is but it, not of as an individual, right? It's yeah, not yeah. to blame an obese yeah, yeah, patient. Yeah, of course, you know, of I think yeah, that yeah, yeah, is yeah, really, yeah. really important to state. Yeah. Is that it's not about just the you, environment I mean, that it, they're it's in. It's really the environment we are living in. So it's it's more you know it's it's not an individual's fault to say yeah, to yeah. become. And I think that's really important because it otherwise really leads to stigmatization of, yeah. of patients. And it, it's really, we, we start understanding there's a real molecular basis, why the system you know, doesn't sensitively operate under the conditions we're living in. So it's not just you know, lack of willpower or something. I mean, we really start understanding the molecular correlate of why the system doesn't operate under the, you know, the conditions we're living in. And yeah. I think that's really, really important to highlight again and again uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And so um, what about diabetes in children or I guess mm. obesity and diabetes? I think we can talk about yeah. them kind of as linked. But what about obesity or diabetes in children versus adults? Okay. Um, what's the difference between them? Also well, on the, the it, biological it, it, level? Increasingly less. Uh, so the, the problem is uh, uh, what we've been talking about is all what's called type 2 diabetes, which yeah. is called the typical, let's say, age related diabetes, which is yeah. by by. Um, Characterized by insulin resistance. Yeah, I guess maybe we should define that. Yeah, really just define one thing real so quick. Type so type two diabetes yeah. is what we're talking about, which is what you can develop later exactly. in life, and type one diabetes is usually what you're born with. No, not really born with, but you develop it very early. Okay. On. So let's say in a traditional view, if you look back textbook thirty years ago, before all of what's happening right now, you have type two diabetes of the elderly, which is ninety percent of the cases, and you know. It, develops closely associated with obesity, insulin resistance, everything we've talked about. But then there's 10% of patients which are affected by type 1 diabetes, and it's a completely different pathophysiology. So you get an autoimmune attack against the, the cells, the beta cells in the mm -hmm. pancreas, which produce insulin. They get destroyed, and your body does not produce any insulin. So usually these patients are lean, they're young, it's an autoimmune disease, and you basically, your, your body kills its own insulin production. And then the only way to treat it is, of course, to exogenously provide the insulin to replace it. Completely different yeah. as physiology. Yeah. But what we're seeing now, uh, due to the obesity epidemic, we're seeing more and more obese kids. Yeah. And now we start seeing something in pediatrics, which you have not never, but rarely seen 30 years ago, is very obese children which now very early on develop insulin resistance and so basically the classical type 2 diabetes. It's very frequent, but you know, it increases and that is of course in a way dangerous because diabetes in long run um, you know, leads to complications. So, and they affect the eye, so you can get mm -hmm. eye complications. Mm -hmm. 
you can get nerve complications. So that, and it's typically that the, the finest vessels in your body get damaged by the high glucose. And so this affects the, the micro vessels which serve the nerves. So then patients start losing you know, sensitivity, touch sensitivity, mm. they develop pain due to the nerve degeneration. So that's called diabetic nef um, neuropathy. Then it damages the, the fine vessels in the kidney, which is called diabetic nephropathy. And so diabetes is, together with hypertension, the most frequent cause of the people who have ultimately kidney failure and have to go on to dialysis. Mm. And because of the uh, damaging the smallest vessels in the eye, in the retina, you know, patients develop diabetic retinopathy and that's a leading cause for blindness in, in Western population. So it's really the long run of that glucose dysregulation, which then leads to all of those complications. And you can imagine, you know, if those, if you have, you know, 20 more years time with diabetes, as you develop it, let's say in early adulthood, something that you otherwise only would have developed 50 plus mm. that gives you another 30 extra years to develop the complications you start seeing the complications earlier and this is a real dilemma about it. yeah so we keep on talking about diabetes but mm. what about pre-diabetes what kind of defines the difference between when you're pre-diabetic mm. and when you're actually diabetic so the uh, so the, the the formal you know definition of diabetes is that your blood glucose exceeds a certain limit which it usually shouldn't exceed and so then it you know it's blunt diabetes glucose is high but there is a pre-diabetes where you basically if you look sensitively enough you can find that the person is insulin resistant and that on occasion the glucose excursions will be higher upon a challenge yeah. But then they still return to some normal level. So if you take a day-to-day -day blood test, it's still within the former range. But if you look careful enough, you can see that, say, and there is a test which is called an oral glucose tolerance test. So you yeah. bring in a patient, didn't eat overnight, and you give a defined dose of glucose, 75 grams. And then you basically look two hours later what happens to the blood glucose concentration. And so if it's in... You know, a normal insulin sensitive subject, it should be below 140 milligram per deciliter. That is normal insulin sensitivity. So the glucose comes in, it gets clear. If you're diabetic, either you start out already with a high level, then you have a diagnosis of diabetes, or your body does not manage to bring it after the two hours below 200. And that is an alternative way to really put the formal diagnosis mm -hmm. out of uh, diabetes and if you're in the range in between let's say between the 140 and 200 two hours after that glucose load and this is what we call impaired glucose tolerance and it's you know very likely that in in long run you will develop diabetes and that's kind of pre-diabetes so it, it really tells you that if yeah. you you know if you challenge the system it, it doesn't have the full flexibility to respond and it's usually indicative that later in life it may yeah. go down to the... What about con uh, continuous glucose monitors? Like, could those be used more to see or detect if someone is pre-diabetic in the hope to then maybe prevent diabetes? I think it's a pretty, uh, pretty high effort to do that, right? I mean, so basically what you're referring to is that there's now continuous blood, uh, glucose monitoring, but you basically yeah, implant patches. a sensor mm. and you can you know, just continuously uh, sense it. I think that that is very good. It has been really good to improve uh, treatment because you just get a much finer you know, time scale resolution of glucose concentrations than always having to you know, basically take a little drop of blood from the yeah. finger, which eventually is, is pretty cumbersome. Um, but it's, it's not a good screening test. You know, it's a pretty high effort. So basically what I said, the, the easiest test is that glucose tolerance test. Yeah. And it also predicts, I mean, if you have a perfectly fine glucose tolerance today, you know, it, it would be enough to, to look later. And I, and I think it's just a one day measure, pretty straightforward. And that is much easier. Um, but there are clearly circumstances where the, you know, continuous glucose monitoring has clear advantages. For example, we know 
it's a different aspect, but uh, just you know, That's fine. talk about everything. Yeah. Um, what what is also you know for really important um, is uh, gestational diabetes. I'm not sure. Where I don't know what that is. Okay, so, so it's basically diabetes it. occurring during pregnancy. Okay, and what's it called again? Gestational, gestational diabetes. Gestational diabetes. Okay. So it uh, develops during during pregnancy, and that is really important to be diagnosed. Because if your if the mother's glucose has high excursions, as it does in diabetes, because mm. it cannot control it, um, the the glucose can be passed on to the to the fetus, and that at later developmental stages has its own pancreas, which then senses the high glucose mm. being reached over from the mother and starts releasing high levels of insulin. And then those kids basically are you know, growing and developing under unphysiologically high insulin concentrations. And this leads to, eventually insulin is, is a growth factor. So there's a closely related growth factor, which is called insulin-like growth factor one, IGF-1, yeah. and they act on closely mm -hmm. related receptors. And then if you have very high insulin concentrations, that can also act on IGF-1 receptors and you get fetal overgrowth. It's called okay. macrosomy, so you have big kids being born. Yeah. And it's also an interesting, I mean, it's a, it's what we know from epidemiology that offspring that is born to mothers who are suffering from diabetes on, during pregnancy, gestational diabetes, they are born with a lifelong predisposition to develop metabolic disorders and hypertension later in life. So it's really important to control blood glucose concentrations and to diagnose diabetes in pregnancy in order to prevent the next generation mm. even being affected. And so that's also something that we're scientifically interested in is really asking the question, you know, how does this high insulin eventually also act on neural circuits which control body weight in long term in the offspring. And so we've done a mouse study where we basically can show that certain neurons, which are in place to suppress feeding in response to leptin, they, the high insulin in the fetus suppresses their projection formation. And that is developmentally timed. In mice, right? I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. mouse data. But, but basically, yeah. if we mimic this in the, in the mouse model, that then basically the, the Kid, pup is born, with, which is a with a brain which is soft wired for body weight regulation, and that itself is enough to set it off with a higher, you know, uh, predisposition to develop obesity later on. And so this is exactly all we're working on. But coming back to the continuous <laughs> glucose monitoring, uh, that is of course very effective, and it's probably the best tool to really monitor. Um, mothers with gestational diabetes, once it's diagnosed, to really optimally treat them to reduce the, the negative impact on the developing fetus. And Could you uh, reverse the diabetes? You can give the, uh, insulin, basically. <laughs> so this is to okay. the mother. Yeah. Then you reduce the glucose concentrations. Yeah. The, the insulin doesn't, is not yeah. being passed on through the placenta. And then if you manage to reduce the glucose concentrations yeah. in the mother, then the fetus will be developing fine. There, we're just talking about insulin resistance, but what about leptin? Is is that not something to worry about? Well, it's. Not, I mean, first of all, leptin very likely. I mean, it doesn't cross the, the placenta either. Okay. okay. So if you manage to basically control the metabolites, such as glucose, which would be passed on, yeah, then I think you can kind of shield the the fetus from the adverse. Okay. things going on in the mother and, and so and it's really well defined for uh, for you know gestational diabetes and yeah. so if you control that okay. in a very tight range so, and therefore it's really important that all pregnancies are really screened for and this is why it's part of the real routine screening program to look at certain points of pregnancy to do exactly that glucose tolerance test to de you know, really sensitively detect women who have gestational diabetes early mm -hmm. on to treat it optimally to reduce the adverse effects on the skin. But this gestational diabetes, does that mainly come 
to women that are pre-diabetic or can that come to anyone? It's perfect. I mean, it's a, that's exactly the right question, but it probably happens in many instances. As we know that um, if a woman develops gestational diabetes, which can revert after pregnancy, that she has a very high likelihood to develop it later on. So it's basically just the, you know, the, the environment of the pregnancy is mm. probably unmasking a predisposition that okay. the individuals carry on, she would develop diabetes, let's say, 20 years later anyways, but now under the conditions of the pregnancy, that is, you know, the system yeah. is pushed and it manifests earlier and it may even revert after the pregnancy. But then you really have to closely follow these women because you know that with very high likelihood they will develop, you know, diabetes later again, even if it reversed after pregnancy. So it's basically the pregnancy is unmasking a predisposition. Which has yeah. been around anyway. Yeah, so with I guess with those kind of women, it doesn't really make sense to wear a continuous glucose monitor beforehand because it's no, the, I mean you don't know who they the are, right? But you you have to yeah. screen the pregnancy to identify the ones which are tipped over the balance. But what about in other patients? I I still feel like, or to me, it seems like continuous glucose monitors could be a really good tool to try to detect early levels of prediabetes. Well, but I mean, what would you want to do? I mean, <clears throat> the question is, do you really want to, you know, put a continuous blood glucose monitor on anybody? Because this is yeah. what it comes down to, right? I mean, the proportions of diabetes will be 10%. And mm. they are 10% right now. And they, if, you know, everything continues on the same dynamics, they will be even higher. And so then the question will be, when do you put it on? For how long do you put it on? So I think it's, as a screening, it's not really... Uh, I, I think the, the, the well standardized tests operate pretty well okay. in order, but it would be already a great help you know, to implement those, which are really straightforward as a, let's say, simple screening strategy. Because that one of the problems is, if, you know, if I may go into the direction, is I mean, a high glucose doesn't hurt. So, you, and the, you know, and usually there is a lag time between it with type 1 diabetes it's it's really clear i mean the beta cells yeah. are destroyed yeah, yeah. then you suddenly get a glucose of 500 and the kid almost ends you know, it worse comes to worse in coma in an emergency room and then diagnosis is done so there is no real lag time between the real happening and the mm. diagnosis but with type 2 diabetes you know you can develop elevated glucose concentrations for a period of time and don't really recognize it doesn't hurt and it you know doesn't you know it may be so usually the signs of the first manifestations is that if the glucose goes beyond a certain threshold so usually glucose is filtered out into the urine and it's reabsorbed but the reabsorption capacity is limited so beyond a certain threshold you then start losing glucose in the urine yeah. And that acts as an osmotic force, and you will, you know, develop something that's called polyuria. You will basically mm. get up at night, and it because basically the, the glucose in the urine starts draining more water into the into the urine. But but this of course takes time, and it's a gradual process. So you can be running around before you hit that kidney border, and really without recognizing what is happening for a year, two years, three years. But then during that period of time. And the elevated glucose can already operate, you know, on the vessels in your eyes, on the vessels in your kidney, in your nerves. And what it really means is that you have that lag period of, let's say, two or three years on average until it's really diagnosed. And then at the first point of diagnosis, already more than 20% of the newly diagnosed diabetic patients have already the complications developed. So, mm -hmm. And so it's really more important coming back to glucose monitoring then yeah. you're just rolling out a broad program everybody running around for the yeah. continuous it would be just much more feasible um, to really give everybody at, at some point a test and you really pick them out as yeah. early as possible could it maybe be beneficial just to see what kind of foods a pre-diabetic person should be eating and which ones they should be avoiding i'm go i'm asking yeah. this based on the perspective that pre-diabetes is reversible so to maybe some that's, extent, that's yeah. also yeah, yeah, a question yeah. sure. that maybe I mean, so we should the, answer. So what, what's really good, I mean, what, what we know is, um, let's, let's assume that in, even in pre-diabetes, your insulin-mediated glucose transport doesn't work as well, right? So then the question could be also, is there an alternative way to deposit 
glucose independent of insulin. And there is actually a way, and a way for muscle cells to take up glucose in an insulin independent way is exercise. So during okay. exercise, your muscle basically takes up, even if it's insulin resistant, it can still take up glucose. So really exercising is a way to normalize, to reduce blood glucose concentrations independent of insulin. And this is why exercise really is an important component in addition to you know, losing weight. Yeah. And then of course there are certain recommendations, I mean, that you shouldn't go for you know, carbohydrates which are you know, rapidly absorbed, give you peak glucose concentrations, but that you rather go mm. for more complex carbohydrates which gets slowly absorbed and that you don't get profiles where the glucose shoots up very high. So it's really the combination of both what you eat, the less, I mean, it's reducing body weight on one hand to increase your insulin sensitivity, the quality of what you eat to really avoid the, the peaking glucose concentrations, and then of course maybe capitalizing on exercise, you know, to help support the system independent of the impact insulin signal. Oh, I definitely want to talk about exercise as well, because I think that's fascinating. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so maybe you want to tell us more about exercise and also like the role that exercise can play in maybe reversing prediabetes yeah. or it, diabetes. It's, it's probably, it's, a, it's, it's really one of the, I, to me, it, it is one of the best measures. And so there are really great studies um, showing, I mean, it's, you know, colleagues in Denmark uh, are very focused on this there. Um, and they have, put, you know, patients, even, pa let's say, diabetic patient who runs on two or three medications in a real, let's say, strenuous exercise program, you're going in five days a week, uh, a supervised combination of cardio and strength training. And they can show that, I mean, a large proportion can even drop their diabetic medication. And I think that's really impressive, right? Wow. I mean, so the number of medications drops, there is in, uh, I think, up to 20% There's a complete reversal even of you know, manifest diabetes. And I think that just highlights the potential yeah. and the power of that, right? So it's, it's really looking at exercise as a kind of, yeah, basic medicine. Right? Yeah. yeah. Is there any particular exercise that works better? So strength well, it's versus a combination cardio? Of both. So oh, basically combination. What, they really, what they really recommend is a, is a balanced program between both. And um, yeah, they, I mean, that's the way. But what I want to, and of course, what, what's also interesting is um, research wise, you can also imagine. I mean, I'm not advocating it in a sense, but if you would understand what is the molecular mechanism of exercise. I was just thinking. I mean, that so basically, well. what you could, if you really do with science and people yeah. do it, right? I mean, basically, if they understand, because eventually also the, you know, the physical exercise has molecularly to be linked to glucose uptake. Yeah. And if you define, could define those mechanisms, I know it would be a fantasy to basically develop the exercise mimetic pill, yeah. which you know triggers the exact same mechanisms, and you sitting on the couch and your body you know is yeah. performing exercise. I mean, it's inside. exactly <laughs> what I was thinking. Like, if we can understand what right. the and, role and that is, exercise plays, exactly. you can develop something in the lab. The only question that I ask is, exercise is free basically for yeah. everyone it's the easiest thing to do right. or uh, I well mean, it depends it depends on your personality yeah. as well and stuff and i know some people would prefer just a pill yeah. but no know, I, I, i'm totally advertising it don't get me wrong but, but yeah I, think, you, you, I mean i know to me i, I also have the same problem let's say i i usually run in the morning with our dog yeah and it's easy in the summer but you know, sometimes oh, you have now? this, or you you you, know, you catch a cold, then you you drop out of it for three yeah. weeks, and then it's so difficult. I mean, some you know, then it's dark, raining. Yeah. In, in order to to really make that hurdle, maybe I'm just not the right perfect exercise yeah. addict. But right. you know, it's 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 really an effort to to really yeah. do it continuously over long. Time. Yeah, no, it definitely is an effort, and then with busy schedules and mm. stuff. In the end, if you have an an alternative to just exercise, mm. that's still the best thing. Yeah. Because if that can help reverse diabetes, then... Yeah. No, I totally agree. But, but I, I totally advertise. I mean, so it's really like exercise. And, and this is also, I mean, that's really the most effective that we can offer our patients right now. If, so we are also run an obesity clinic, right? And right now, there is limited, you know, pharmaceutical potential to really treat obesity, to reduce mm. body weight. 
And so the, the best thing that we can offer at this point is really uh, very intense programs where we do dietary counseling together with an exercise program, you know, psychological support, you know, people meeting in a group and really have a very structured program running over a year. Mm -hmm. And that really works. I mean, people lose, let's say, on average, what, 20 kilograms in such a program. And even if then they go back to the, to the wild, they are able to maintain that reduced body weight. But, but if you really try to do all of that on your own without the right counseling, and I mean, so many people want to lose weight, but it's just so hard to do it, right? And so therefore it really needs the, the whole framework to support that initial drive. Mm -hmm. I think also one of the main problems is that there's just, for example, with healthy eating, there's just so many different opinions out right. there. So, so who do you listen to if you don't have medical advice? Right. I mean, basically you, you should seek professional advice. Yeah. And this is why we're offering exactly those programs. And But what is also, I mean, at, at the end, you, you find, I mean, you can read about it in the lay press, you know, no carbohydrates, only fat yeah. diet, this diet, that diet, right? At the end of the day, there's no convincing uh, data to suggest that any specific diet type is superior to another one, as long as you manage to reduce calorie intake, right? I mean, so, yeah. and you shouldn't go to extreme diet. So I think in, in my view, it is really the recommendation to go for a calorie reduced balanced diet. I mean, this is what it comes down. Eat healthy food, less of it. Yeah. And that's the safest way. And there's no magic to only eating this or only eating that, that will give you weight loss despite eating. And so it's really, yeah. What about intermittent fasting? Because that's a really hot that's topic. That's really a hot topic. Days. And then this is also a really, really interesting from a scientific point of view, because it's, it also, again, offers room to uh, you know, for scientific discovery, understanding molecular mechanisms of, of intermittent fasting. And so it's, it's really, I mean, I think the, the, the glucose metabolism improving actions are well documented, at least in animal models. I think the human data aren't even that, despite many people talking about it. Mm. I think it's, it's really the strongest is preclinical data at this point and it really remains to be seen what is really the mechanism but clearly it's it's but also one has to say that even in intermittent fasting it, it comes usually if you do it in a clinical setting it just reduces overall yeah. you know food intake yeah it's, it's usually not that people if they don't eat for 16 hours that they really fully catch up during those eight hours that they are eating it, so it, it, it is it's clearly it's a component that you probably drive um, energy expenditure that, you know, if you, if you don't eat for a certain period that you increase burning calories, that is clearly a component. But at the end of the day, many people doing intermittent fasting at the end eat clearly much less than what they would have eaten yeah. on a continuous basis. So the fasting period that you get with intermittent fasting, you don't think has such a well, big I'm, impact? Well, I, I really don't unknown. know. But I, I think it's it's not fully resolved in in okay. humans. Put it like that. In in rodent models, it seems to have an effect, a clear effect. Um, but again, I mean, the, the mechanisms for it are not really fully yeah. understood. Yeah. And so, in order also to pre maybe prevent diabetes, or if you're diabetic, is there certain foods that you should eat at certain times of the day? Well, in general, it's independent of uh, of diabetes or not. What is known again from preclinical studies is that what we're learning more and more is that in many metabolic pathways, there's a natural circadian rhythmicity. Yeah. Good. I was going to ask if you should eat with your circadian rhythm. You, and you should definitely do that. Okay. And because uh, there's, I think it's an interesting mouse experiment, and there's also clinical human data to support that. If you, let's say, have a normal mouse, which is lean, and so they're active during the night, they're eating during the night, they're sleeping during the day. I mean, that's reverse. Yeah. No, right. yeah, 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 it's yeah, reverse. So, and so, um, and they eat 90% of what they eat during the night. If you have a healthy mouse, if you measure what they're eating, and if you basically feed them the same, exact same amount of food, same number of calories that they would have eaten during their natural night cycle, basically only offered to them during the day cycle, 
they will get obese. Mm. Just meaning that it's really important the timing of your meal. And then, of course, you can extrapolate that to our living that, you know, we would be normally operating in the you know, day's light cycle and that also our clocks in our organs, including liver, muscles, everything, are adjusted to, to that time scale and optimized in terms of metabolic capacity during that time. Uh, for, then it turns against you, you know, eating the calories at you know, midnight when you walk out of a bar or something like that, right? Yeah. So then that would just be the total analogy of this. So I think it's it's really indicating that you should eat, you know, during a natural day cycle and not in the middle of the night, which of course, you know, also may explain why potentially obesity you know, may be occurring, let's say, in shift workers more mm. readily than in people. Yeah. So what actually happens inside the body on a metabolic level if you eat outside of the most active mm. time of the day? But so that's in, in the most general terms that the, that the enzymes which are made in the liver to metabolize, just the example, glucose, fat, whatever, that they, they are oscillating on a daily basis. And so mm -hmm. the, that your liver is prepared to deal best with the calories when the enzymes are there to metabolize it. And if you, you know, dump the food on them, on the organ, when any enzyme that is required to take care of it, mm. you know, is at its lowest state, then you can easily imagine that then the whole thing gets out of balance and doesn't work as efficiently as it should be when, when your food intake matches yeah. the optimal responsiveness of the organ. Yeah, so I guess it's really important to just eat in the most active time yeah. of the day. Yeah. Um, and are there also certain food, like food groups that maybe you should be eating in the morning or avoiding no, in the not evening? Really. I mean, I think, I think so, it's really, the, it's, it's more the balanced diet, you know, at any time during the day, I mean, during the natural eating time. Yeah. Okay. Uh, what about sleep? Okay. How, does sleep also play a really important role? Yes. <laughs> like, at, so I, I mean, obviously sleep is very important. It's, I think everyone mm -hmm. could say sleep will play an important role in everything. Right. But do you also have actual data to show that sleep is important? Well, you have, you have the inverse data. And we also okay. just have a research program on that. So the, uh, what, what we know is that in obesity, uh, the sleeping patterns get disturbed in, in the most general term. And so what you seem to get is more fragmented sleep, which then, of course, in turn contributes also to an offset of your activities from that natural mm -hmm. so again, just giving one example right and then of course you don't feel as well and but it seems that if you have sleep deprivation that there might be bi-directional interaction that then also your energy homeostasis regulatory system doesn't operate as sensitively as it usually does so it really it goes in both ways. So if you don't sleep appropriately, it may predispose you for obesity. And in turn, once you get obese, okay. it further yeah. you know, fragments your sleep pattern. Yeah. Um, okay, so we've defined sleep, exercise, uh, lifestyle factors. That's all great. Mm. So what kind of medical treatments are there? Okay. Uh, so I think you've already mentioned that there's not really that many medical yes. treatments to treat diabetes. Well, for diabetes, there are a couple. Okay. It's much um, better. Uh, for obesity, for obesity it's really yeah. limited. And so, I mean, of course, it was the hype when, you know, when leptin was identified, everybody's like, okay, obesity is down, we just give leptin. Yeah. But then, you know, people start realizing there's leptin resistance. There is basically one uh, drug right now on the market, which I think is very promising, which was developed from a diabetes perspective. It was made as a diabetes um, uh, medication. And it is acting like a hormone which is naturally produced in our gut and that's called glucagon like peptide glp1 mm -hmm. and glp1 was first identified that if you eat glucose that this is released from the gut and it acts on the pancreas to enhance the sensitivity of the beta cells to the glucose to release insulin and then it was developed. The problem is that natural GLP-1 has a super short half-life. So if mm. you now take that hormone, you cannot base it. Well, I should say that. But it, it's a peptide hormone, which is usually degraded in the stomach. So you can take it as a pill primarily. But then, uh, so, um, but if you inject it, it's so rapidly degraded 
that this didn't be any further. So then what was developed is kind of artificial analogs of the GLP-1 receptor. And these are called GLP-1 analogs. They act like mm. the natural hormone. And they were first developed for diabetes. But then it was recognized that the GLP-1 receptor is also present in the brain and exactly in those neurons which respond to insulin, leptin, and that in addition to controlling glucose, they also reduced appetite. And this eventually led, and uh, so this put them on the market. So they were first marketed as a diabetes drug, it's very effective, um, but through the appetite suppressing effect, it now also has an indication for yeah. uh, people. And, and this is pretty much it at this point in time, what we have to offer for you know, uh, for obese patients yeah. in on the pharmacological side. But there are new developments. I mean, of course, we're really trying to understand, can we develop something like leptin sensitizers? You know, something that re instates normal leptin sensitivity. So there's, you know, preclinical developments in that direction. And there's a whole more in that area, but nothing really has entered clinical practice beyond you know the the GLP one analogs that I've been yeah. Sorry. Actually, you mentioned leptin, and now I do have another question. So I'm going to go back, and then I'm going to go okay. back to the treatments. But so, uh, what actually determines how in healthy human beings right now? What determines how much leptin and ghrelin we have? Because different people can like eat different amounts of food. So clearly, they have no. It's your body fat content. Oh, it's, it's just, it's, it's just really it's a fat sensor. Wow. So really, the leptin levels in circulation run perfectly in correlation, in correlation. with your okay. fat content. Okay. And, uh, and the ghrelin really increases in starvation, so it's a signal of release. So if yeah. you don't eat for a period of time, then ghrelin levels go up. But this is not a lot of individual variation, so it's really more this you yeah. know, flexible regulation. And it's really not that... So people also thought, well, let's, let's develop... Um, ghrelin antagonist block yeah and, and those didn't work to suppress food intake and the, okay. the problem is also that i think that the system is so redundant in the brain as i said we're evolutionary optimized to maintain feeding so if you you know go in on one side to suppress feeding very likely yeah. there is a compensatory pathway being activated and that of course makes it super super difficult and therefore already the glp1 is an interesting drug because we know now that it acts on so many brain sites and it it's almost serendipitous how nice it mm -hmm. works and really understanding the full basis why it works to suppress feeding isn't even clear yeah so there's not so many treatments available do you think that in the next few years that's going to change or a lot more research but it's a lot more research done. going on and it is also um, it is, I mean, they're, they're clearly promising candidates. So what, what people have started doing is, so GLP-1 is, you know, is, is one example, and it works. And it can give you, let's say, a 15% weight reduction, 10%, mm -hmm. something like that. So if you have 130 kilograms on average, yeah. there are better responders, some don't respond. Let's say you lose 13 kilograms. I mean, that doesn't solve fully your problem, yeah. right? And so what people have been trying is to take other gut peptides and fuse them into one molecule that you're not only targeting the GLP-1 receptor, but also, you know, tickling receptors for other gut mm -hmm. peptides. And there is clearly very promising data from preclinical studies and first clinical studies that they may be superior to the effect of GLP-1 alone. And so those are basically on the verge of entering clinical practice. And they may be in a, you know, in a preclinical model, they give you 20, 25% weight loss, but not, in, I mean, that yeah. hasn't been fully validated in, in humans, but there is clearly development which look promising and then also alternative approaches. The better we understand the system, I think the more, the more we can So do what if you combine exercise, sleep, healthy eating with maybe one of these drugs that hasn't shown amazing results on its own. Mm. I'm assuming it's always been tested on its own. No, it's, it always comes. I mean, usually it comes, I mean, there's nothing that you can just, you know, normalize sleep. Let's put it like that. Yeah. But I yeah. think usually it should always be, and this is why we're offering, this is what I'm saying. So this is what we're offering is these, you know, 
really controlled interventions, lifestyle interventions, I mean, they are active by themselves. And then if you add that with, uh, uh, with something like a GF1 analog, yeah. of course, it gives you additional effects. And then you can really get into a pretty substantial weight loss. And then the next problem is to maintain that, right? And then, of yeah. course, you have to have your lifestyle adjusted. The problem is one um, that our system tries to fight, fight back weight loss. You know, yeah. So what usually happens, and it's pretty well documented, that if you diet, let's say your, your energy expenditure was, whatever, make up a number, 2,000 calories a day. You want to lose weight, you diet, you eat 500 calories, 900 calories, your net balance goes down, you lose weight. The problem is your body you know, somehow senses you're in an energy deficit. And what it does is fights it by reducing energy expenditure, mm. which is fine. Let's say now it goes down from 2000 to 1700, you're still eating 900, so you still lose weight. The problem is your body will remember mm. that perception of energy deficit. When you go back to your 2000 calories, which would have been equivalent to what you spent before you went into the diet, now your body will maintain for extended period of time, up to two years, the so 1700 energy expenditure. So if you only go back to your originally neutral food intake, it will give you the the you know additional weight gain again. And this kind of you know this problem with this yo-yo mm -hmm. effect that you diet and then you overshoot and and at the end it all goes into one direction. And this is why you really need those structured programs to maintain. Yeah eventually the combination of exercise reduce feeding and it's, it's really it's, it's, it's a long-term enterprise but it works i mean so it's not yeah. it, so that it wouldn't work but it, yeah, you it, just have to be aware of it that your body really wants to fight body weight yeah it really seems like actually for to treat obesity is you have to also maintain it for exactly. then. you have to change your lifestyle completely, completely. Yeah, and so also these the drugs or the preventative or the treatments actually against obesity would they be thought to then that you have to keep on taking yes. them? I mean, the, your the whole, the life whole then? perspective as of now is it would be a chronic treatment as treating you know hypertension where you have to take the drugs for it, and that of course is also a problem from a drug development perspective because they have to be very safe, right? I mean, yeah. so what you have to develop is something that somebody potentially has to take for whatever, 40 years. And that puts a very high burden on the drug development process. Mm -hmm. And that is also something which has really made big pharma companies, despite having all the potential to develop yeah. those drugs, walk out of that indication because you know, it's much easier, I don't know how to say that, but let's assume you're, you're, you're treating cancer. You, you have a patient who has a very limited life expectancy, sadly, but let's say EU. If you develop a new drug which helps to survive the patient an extra year, half year, I mean, almost any side effect will be tolerated, right, if you compare yeah. it to a conventional chemotherapy. And that, of course, from a marketing perspective of a pharma company is a much easier target than developing a pill which somebody has to safely take over 40 years to eventually improve you know, life mm. quality and uh, extend life. And, and that puts a, the burden really high on that drug development and it makes it also very likely to fail you know, in very long term as side effects. So, for example, there was a, a drug out which was a cannabinoid receptor modifying drug which worked beautifully for weight reduction. Very nice, like it was mm. only like what 15 years ago. And you know, huge development cost. It was it enrolled into the market, and you can imagine until a drug really makes it into the market, it you know, the company has spent yeah. whatever hundreds of millions into that. And then, so because it was modulating in the brain eating behavior, then you know, you know, patients treated with it a few 
in number, but still, you know, committed suicide in relation to that because it was interfering with brain circuits, which eventually mm -hmm. uh, involved mood, and it was taken off the market. And that, of course, was a clear message, also highlighting the risk of going into that direction, because I mean, from a company perspective, it's it's a huge loss, and that. You know, balancing out where you put your strategic developments, rather yeah. on it from an you know, economical perspective, it's much safer to go in certain indications than going into a direction which really requires you know a high level of safety for a very long time. And that is yeah. Good. What about a medication in, ch in children? Is that are we talking about the same ones? Like you could administer them in. But it's even less. I mean that children. they even don't have the admission. I mean the the. Um, I mean there there are basically no clinical trials on yeah. medications in in children unless there are certain again rare mutations there are now. Um, and because the mutations already manifest in children, and there there is new drugs coming up. If if you have certain mutations in a receptor which is involved in you know downstream neurons of the leptin pathway, that you can you know really treat those which are genetically predisposed with that. But uh, other than that, I mean it's the same conventional yeah. strategies that you would follow in adults. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so it seems like there's still some challenging times ahead. True. Um, but it's a lot to be discovered. And what, what yeah. I really like about it is really the fundamental aspect, and this is ultimately what Max Planck stands for, is trying to understand the system, right? I think it's a yeah. really fascinating system. And I think treating your know, patients is one thing, but I mean, I think that you, first of all, you have to understand how the system works. And it's so complex. And this is, I think, yeah. that is really the science that fascinates us, is trying to, you know, first understand what is the neurocircuitry, where are the neurons which sense the energy, to which neurons do they talk, you know, how do ultimately all the different inputs come together, which are balanced, to ultimately come to the decision, will I eat, will I not eat? And I think this is just fascinating neurobiology and also how to integrate, how to send out the signals to your peripheral organs you know, in complete, basically, uh, we view those centers, it's almost like, you know, conductor in an orchestra, right? I mean, you have mm -hmm. somebody sitting there getting all the input from outside, and then you're orchestrating, you know, something to, you know, take a bite or not, to your liver to, you know, produce glucose or not. And I think that's just what really fascinates me about yeah. the science behind it. Yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm fascinated by how complex our system is, but I think that's also what makes developing the drugs yeah, so hard. Completely hard. It's right. just, I think we, we're we still lacking so much information. Yeah, exactly. So, but, you know, that's up to you. So yeah. I will, uh, I will come keep back on, in a few years. Come, come back in a few years, <laughs> then we can talk about it. So the final thing that I wanted to talk about was COVID, um, mm -hmm. the COVID pandemic, because um, it seems like a lot of COVID deaths in kids are also due to kids that have core morbidities. Mm -hmm. And it seems like there is a link between obesity and uh, an increased risk of developing COVID. But it's, uh, I mean, basically the, the risk that is best documented, I think, is at this point, and it's not only true for kids, it's largely true for adults as well. Yeah. Is, is really that there's a clear risk factor to develop severe complications of COVID as a consequence of obesity and diabetes. So those yeah. are the two, and it just highlights also the importance in today's ep epidemic to really, you know, fight that back. The the ideas why that is, is not really 100% clear, okay. if you want to get to that. Yeah, <laughs> so I was just, I was just it's, interested. It's, no, it's, I think it's, it's multifaceted. We also, for example, we know that uh, one way to become insulin resistant in obesity is that you also get dysregulated inflammation. So what we usually talk about is if if you expand your fat mass as an obese subject or animal model, um, it's not only that the fat gets bigger and the fat cells get bigger, that it's so it's not only a, um, a quantitative change of adipose tissue, but you start seeing that cells which are usually only present in low number in adipose tissue start to increase. And those are cells of the immune system, like macrophages, mm -hmm. lymphocytes, and they somehow get activated in this environment and they release what usually they would release when you're fighting an infection. So then cytokines are released. And cytokines have also been shown to cause insulin resistance. So there is kind of, mm -hmm. it's called of this, 
And it's called, the, the, the term is meta-inflammation. So that the obesity, it's, it's not like, you know, having a fever and a full-blown inflammatory state as, you know, fighting bacteria, but that you have a chronic low-grade inflammation. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so maybe it's the offset of the inflammatory response, which is driven by obesity, which then you also compromise your ability to fully, you know, fight viruses and and that's one of the aspects how it's viewed right that you have a mm -hmm. chronic set off in your immune homeostasis due to the uh, metabolic environment but what about the flu do we see the same um correlation between obesity and developing i would guess yes honestly okay. i really don't know the numbers okay. it, so it would be a guess yeah and, but it's clear the data are out there but i, I yeah. won't predict that it's the exact same okay. thing that the complication will be more but don't quote me. Yeah, yeah, of course, of course, of course. Yeah, because that's what would really fascinate yeah. me if it's just something to do with COVID. No, no, it's not, no, no, it's not or... only COVID. I mean, what's really clear mm. is that your risk, let's say, on, a, let's say, on an equivalent bacterial infection to go into sepsis, like the full-blown yeah. uh, manifestation, is much higher if you're diabetic. So it's, it's really, this is nothing limited to COVID. I think it's just a massive spread, which has you know, brought it to the attention of everybody. But there's clear predisposition for much more severe uh, cause of many infectious diseases, yeah. bacterial infections, in diabetes, uh, just beyond COVID, definitely. So it really seems like we need to treat or reverse diabetes, yeah. and then automatically you will also Improve reduce. Or, yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So this has been a really good conversation. I've learned a lot. I hope the audience has as well. I hope you enjoyed it as totally. well. And thanks so much for the um, conversation. And the yeah. Opportunity. Thank you pleasure. so much. Okay. Cool. That's it. Thank you all so much for listening. If you would like to learn more about Professor Jens Brunning's work, please visit the Max Planck Institute for Metabolism Research website. And if you like our podcasts, make sure to follow us on Twitter, LinkedIn, and our Instagram page. This is the best way to stay up to date with what episodes we will be releasing in season three. And trust me, we have a lot of good episodes planned. Thank you again for listening. Bye. Austrian Magazine, the podcast is brought to you by the Max Planck PhD Net Science Communication Group known as the Austrian Magazine. The intro outro music is composed by Serena Frankumar and the pre-intro jingle is composed by Gustavo Carrizzo. If you have any feedback, comments, or suggestions, please feel free to write us at offspring.podcasts at phdnet.mpg.de. Until next week, stay safe, stay healthy. Bye.